Welcome to Bite at a Time Books, where we read you your favorite classics one bite at a time. My name is Brie Carlisle, and I love to read and wanted to share my passion with listeners like you. If you want to know what's coming next and vote on upcoming books, sign up for our newsletter at biteatatimebooks.com. You'll also find our new t-shirts in the shop, including podcast shirts and quote shirts from your favorite classic novels. Be sure to follow my show on your favorite podcast platform so you get all the new episodes. You can find most of our links in the show notes. But also our website, biteatatimebooks.com, includes all of the links for our show, including to our Patreon to support the show, and YouTube, where we have special behind-the-narration of the episodes. We're part of the Bite at a Time Books Productions Network. If you'd also like to hear what inspired your favorite classic authors to write their novels— and what was going on in the world at the time, check out the Bite at a Time Books Behind the Story podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. Please note, while we try to keep the text as close to the original as possible, some words have been changed to honor the marginalized communities who've identified the words as harmful and to stay in alignment with Bite at a Time Books brand values. Today we'll be continuing Great Expectations by Charles Dickens. Chapter 28 It was clear that I must repair to our town next day, and in the first flow of my repentance, it was equally clear that I must stay at Joe's. But when I had secured my box place by tomorrow's coach and had been down to Mr. Pockets and back, I was not by any means convinced on the last point, and began to invent reasons and make excuses for putting up at the Blue Boar. I should be an inconvenience at Joe's, I was not expected, and my bed would not be ready. I should be too far from Miss Havisham's, and she was exacting and mightn't like it. All other swindlers upon earth are nothing to the self-swindlers, and with such pretenses did I cheat myself. Surely a curious thing. That I should innocently take a bad half-crown of somebody else's manufacture is reasonable enough. But that I should knowingly reckon the spurious coin of my own make is good money— an obliging stranger under pretense of compactly folding up my banknotes for security's sake, abstracts the notes and gives me nutshells. But what is his sleight of hand to mine when I fold up my own nutshells and pass them on myself as notes? Having settled that I must go to the Blue Boar, my mind was much disturbed by indecision whether or not to take the Avenger. It was tempting to think of that expensive mercenary publicly airing his boots in the archway of the Blue Boar's posting yard. It was almost solemn to imagine him casually produced in the tailor's shop and confounding the disrespectful senses of Trab's boy. On the other hand, Trab's boy might worm himself into his intimacy and tell him things. Or reckless and desperate wretch as I knew he could be might hoot him in the high street. My patroness, too, might hear of him and not approve. On the whole, I resolved to leave the Avenger behind. It was the afternoon coach by which I had taken my place— and as winter had now come round, I should not arrive at my destination until two or three hours after dark. Our time of starting from the cross keys was two o'clock. I arrived on the ground with a quarter of an hour to spare, attended by the Avenger. If I may connect that expression with one who never attended on me, if he could possibly help it. At that time, it was customary to carry convicts down to the dockyards by stagecoach, as I had often heard of them in the capacity of outside passengers, and had more than once seen them on the high road dangling their ironed legs over the coach roof, I had no cause to be surprised when Herbert, meeting me in the yard, came up and told me there were two convicts going down with me. But I had a reason that was an old reason now for constitutionally faltering whenever I heard the word convict. "'You don't mind them, Handel,' said Herbert. "'Oh, no.' I thought you seemed as if you didn't like them. I can't pretend that I do like them, and I suppose you don't particularly. But I don't mind them. See, there they are, said Herbert, coming out of the tap. What a degraded and vile sight it is. They had been treating their guard, I suppose, for they had a jailer with them, and all three came out wiping their mouths on their hands. The two convicts were handcuffed together and had irons on their legs, irons of a pattern that I knew well. They wore the dress that I likewise knew well. Their keeper had a brace of pistols and carried a thick-knobbed bludgeon under his arm, but he was on terms of good understanding with them and stood with them beside him, 
Looking on at the pudding two of the horses, rather with an air as if the convicts were an interesting exhibition not formally open at the moment, and he, the curator. One was a taller and stouter man than the other, and appeared as a matter of course, according to the mysterious ways of the world, both convict and free, to have had allotted to him the smaller suit of clothes. His arms and legs were like great pincushions of those shapes, and his attire disguised him absurdly, but I knew his half-closed eye at one glance. There stood the man whom I had seen on the settle at the Three Jolly Bargemen on a Saturday night, and who had brought me down with his invisible gun. It was easy to make sure that as yet he knew me no more than if he had never seen me in his life. He looked across at me, and his eye appraised my watch chain, and then he incidentally spat and said something to the other convict, and they laughed and slewed themselves round with a clink of their coupling manacle, and looked at something else. The great numbers on their backs, as if they were street doors. Their coarse, mangy, ungainly outer surface, as if they were lower animals. Their ironed legs, apologetically garlanded with pocket handkerchiefs. And the way in which all present looked at them and kept from them made them, as Herbert had said, a most disagreeable and degraded spectacle. But this was not the worst of it. It came out that the whole of the back of the coach had been taken by a family removing from London, and that there were no places for the two prisoners but on the seat in front behind the coachman. Hereupon, a choleric gentleman, who had taken the fourth place on that seat, flew into a most violent passion, and said that it was a breach of contract to mix him up with such villainous company, and that it was poisonous and pernicious and infamous and shameful, and I don't know what else. At this time, the coach was ready and the coachman impatient, and we were all preparing to get up, and the prisoners had come over with their keeper, bringing with them that curious flavor of bread poultice, bays, rope yarn, and hearthstone which attends the convict presence. "'Don't take it so much amiss, sir,' pleaded the keeper to the angry passenger. "'I'll sit next to you myself. I'll put them on the outside of the row. They won't interfere with you, sir. You need not know they're there.' And don't blame me, growled the convict I'd recognized. I don't want to go. I'm quite ready to stay behind. As far as I'm concerned, anyone's welcome to my place. Or mine, said the other gruffly. I wouldn't have incommoded none of you if I'd had my way. Then they both laughed and began cracking nuts and spitting the shells about, as I really think I should have liked to do myself if I had been in their place and so despised. At length, it was voted that there was no help for the angry gentleman, and that he must either go in his chance company or remain behind. So he got into his place, still making complaints, and the keeper got into the place next him, and the convicts hauled themselves up as well they could, and the convict I'd recognized sat behind me with his breath on the hair of my head. "'Goodbye, Handel,' Herbert called out as we started. I thought what a blessed fortune it was that he had found another name for me than Pip, it is impossible to express with what acuteness I felt the convict's breathing, not only on the back of my head, but all along my spine. The sensation was like being touched in the marrow with some pungent and searching acid. It set my very teeth on edge. He seemed to have more breathing business to do than another man, and to make more noise in doing it, and I was conscious of growing high-shouldered on one side in my shrinking endeavors to fend him off. The weather was miserably raw, and the two cursed the cold. It made us all lethargic before we had gone far, and when we had left the halfway house behind, we habitually dozed and shivered and were silent. I dozed off myself in considering the question whether I ought to restore a couple of pounds sterling to this creature before losing sight of him, and how it could best be done. In the act of dipping forward, as if I were going to bathe among the horses, I woke in a fright and took the question up again. But I must have lost it longer than I had thought, since... Although I could recognize nothing in the darkness and the fitful lights and shadows of our lamps, I traced marsh country in the cold, damp wind that blew at us. Cowering forward for warmth and to make me a screen against the wind, the convicts were closer to me than before. The very first words I heard them interchange as I became conscious were the words of my own thoughts. Two one-pound notes. "'How did he get them? said the convict I had never seen. "'How should I know?' returned the other. He had him stowed away some house, given by friends, I expect. I wish, said the other with a bitter curse upon the cold, that I had him here. Two one-pound notes or friends? 
two one-pound notes. I'd sell all the friends I ever had for one and think it a blessed good bargain. Well, so he says. So he says, resumed the convict I had recognized. It was all said and done in half a minute, behind a pile of timber in the dockyard. You're going to be discharged. Yes, I was, when I find out that boy that had fed him and kept his secret, and give him them two one-pound notes. Yes, I would, and I did. More fool you, growled the other. I'd have spent him on a man in whittles and drink. He must have been a green one. Mean to say he knowed nothing of you? Not a port. Different gangs and different ships. He was tried again for prison breaking and got made a lifer. And was that... Honor, the only time you worked out in this part of the country? The only time. What might have been your opinion of the place? A most beastly place. Mud bank, mist, swamp, and work. Work, swamp, mist, and mud bank. They both execrated the place in very strong language and gradually growled themselves out and had nothing left to say. After overhearing this dialogue, I should assuredly have got down and been left in the solitude and darkness of the highway. But for feeling certain that the man had no suspicion of my identity, indeed, I was not only so changed in the course of nature, but so differently dressed and so differently circumstanced, that it was not at all likely he could have known me without accidental help. Still, the coincidence of our being together on the coach was sufficiently strange to fill me with a dread that some other coincidence might at any moment connect me in his hearing with my name. For this reason, I resolved to alight as soon as we touched the town, and put myself out of his hearing. This device I executed successfully. My little portmanteau was in the boot under my feet. I had but to turn a hinge to get it out. I threw it down before me, got down after it, and was left at the first lamp on the first stones of the town pavement. As to the convicts, they went their way with the coach, and I knew at what point they would be spirited off to the river. In my fancy, I saw the boat with its convict crew waiting for them at the slime wash stairs. Again heard the gruff, give way you, like and order to dogs, again saw the wicked Noah's Ark lying out on the black water. I could not have said what I was afraid of, for my fear was altogether undefined and vague, but there was great fear upon me. As I walked on to the hotel, I felt that a dread, much exceeding the mere apprehension of a painful or disagreeable recognition, made me tremble. I'm confident that it took no distinctness of shape, and that it was the revival for a few minutes of the terror of childhood. The coffee room at the Blue Boar was empty, and I had not only ordered my dinner there but had sat down to it, before the waiter knew me. As soon as he had apologized for the remiss of his memory, he asked me if he should send boots for Mr. Pumblechook. No, said I, certainly not. The waiter... It was he who had brought up the great remonstrance from commercials on the day when I was bound, appeared surprised, and took the earliest opportunity of putting a dirty old copy of a local newspaper so directly in my way, that I took it up and read this paragraph. Our readers will learn, not altogether without interest, in reference to the recent romantic rise and fortune of a young artificer of iron in this neighborhood. What a theme, by the way, for the magic pen of our as yet not universally acknowledged townsman, Tooby, the poet of our columns that the youth's earliest patron, companion, and friend was a highly respected individual, not entirely unconnected with the corn and seed trade, and whose eminently convenient and commodious business premises are situated within a hundred miles of the high street. It is not wholly irrespective of our personal feelings that we record him as the mentor of our young Telemachus, for it is good to know that our town produced the founder of the latter's fortunes. Does the thought-contracted brow of the local sage of the lustrous eye of local beauty inquire whose fortunes? We believe that Quentin Matsis was the blacksmith of Antwerp, verb sap. I entertain a conviction based upon large experience that if the days of my prosperity I had gone to the North Pole, I should have met somebody there wandering Esquimau or civilized man, would have told me that Pumblechook was my earliest patron and the founder of my fortunes. Thank you for joining Bite at a Time Books today, while we read a bite of one of your favorite classics. Again, my name is Brie Carlisle, and I hope you come back tomorrow for the next bite of Great Expectations. Don't forget to sign up for our newsletter at biteatatimebooks.com and check out the shop. You can check out the show notes or our website, biteatatimebooks.com, for the rest of the links for our show. We'd love to hear from you on social media as well.